Welcome to Neurology Now. I'm Stephanie Stevens. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Charnas, Chief of Staff at the VA Boston Healthcare System and Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School and Boston University School of Medicine. A fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, Dr. Charnas has treated hundreds of patients with neurological complications of alcoholism. Dr. Charnas, we hear a lot about moderate drinking. What does that mean exactly? If Benjamin Franklin were alive today and still living by his aphorism, everything in moderation, it would be about a drink per day for women and about two drinks per day for men. And that doesn't come from Benjamin Franklin. It comes from a dietary advisory committee for Americans. There's no absolute cutoff, of course, so these are approximate. We can try to sort of work backwards at what moderate is simply by thinking of what amount of drinking can people do safely and enjoyably without causing harm. That kind of information comes from very large epidemiological studies, one in particular that was more than 43,000 U.S. adults, and it showed that most people who drank below their recommended limits didn't get into trouble, and most people who drank above did. So for women, it's not more than seven drinks per week uh, and three drinks per day. And for men, it's not more than 14 drinks per week and four drinks per day. And, and those numbers need to be adjusted for certain populations. So elderly patients, people over the age of 65, male and female, not more than three at a time and seven per week. And for women who are either pregnant or trying to become pregnant, none at all. And why are women advised to drink less than men? Well, it turns out that women are more sensitive to some of the harms caused by alcohol than men. And also, when women and men drink the same amount, women have higher blood alcohol concentrations than men. It's a consequence of women usually weighing less than men. And also, alcohol distributes in body water and women have less body water than men per pound, so they develop a higher concentration of alcohol than men do. That means that when a woman drinks, her blood alcohol concentration is going to be higher than a man's if they drink the same amount at the same rate with the same amount of food in their stomach. Do you think most people who drink think they're drinking moderately? I think it's a really great question because part of the nature of alcoholism or alcohol use disorders is to drink without full control, in many instances without regard to the consequences. What that means is that people who are really addicted will begin to tell themselves that they're not having a problem and that they can stop drinking or that they don't need one more drink, but it's okay to have it because it doesn't feel like it's a problem to them, and that becomes a very difficult problem. I think also the guidelines that we spoke of can be interpreted liberally by people who define down what a drink is. For research purposes, NIAAA talks about a drink being 14 grams of pure alcohol, and that, that means about 12 ounces of regular beer, which is 5% alcohol, or about 5 ounces of wine, which is usually 12% alcohol, or about one and a half ounces of distilled spirits, which are usually about 40% alcohol. Well, if a person says, I'm just going to have one drink, and they fill their wine glass with vodka, they're having a lot more than one drink. And that, that I think, is part of the problem that people run into who have alcohol use disorders, which is beginning to define down what a drink is or how much they are drinking because they don't want to have to grapple with the fact that they really do have a problem drinking. Will you tell us briefly about research that supports the health benefits of drinking for the brain? This kind of research comes largely from epidemiological studies. The studies for many years have shown that there's something resembling a U-shaped curve, that people who don't drink at all have a somewhat higher risk for heart disease and stroke than people who drink those amounts that I just referred to, about a drink a day for women and about two drinks a day for men. Not every study shows it equally for men and women, but a substantial number of studies have shown this effect. The effect seems to hold up even when you control for other risk factors for heart disease and stroke, like smoking and blood pressure and levels of blood lipids. And it seems to be true 
in many different parts of the world as well. It isn't clear that one particular form of alcohol, red wine versus white wine versus beer, is necessarily associated with greater benefit. And of course, there are probably some harms associated with alcohol that occur even in what we would call the moderate range of drinking. I, I already alluded to drinking during pregnancy, but it's also the case that people who have certain medical conditions or are taking certain medications shouldn't have anything to drink at all. And it's also the case that people who are going to do something dangerous like drive a car or operate heavy machinery would need to be even more moderate if not drinking at all before they do some of those more dangerous tasks. And what about those studies that show alcohol is harmful? If you exceed those recommended levels of drinking, there are a whole host of harms that are associated with those increased amounts of drinking. I mentioned birth defects, fetal alcohol syndrome or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Certainly, the more people drink, the more likely they are to develop an alcohol use disorder, alcoholism or alcohol abuse, and a substantial number of people in this country have those. There are really very significant health problems affecting almost every organ in the body that are associated with heavier levels of drinking. The gut, the liver, pancreas uh, are all sensitive to alcohol. Certainly at heavy levels of drinking, the heart is very sensitive. Blood pressure can go up or can be very difficult to manage in people who drink above those prescribed limits. Diabetes can be more difficult to manage then there are certain kinds of cancers, cancers of the mouth and throat, the esophagus and the stomach and the colon all seem to have an increased risk, cancer of the liver when people drink, and and even breast cancer seems to be associated with, uh, in an almost linear fashion, the amount that people drink. Probably one of the most serious harms is that alcohol impairs people's ability to function normally and is associated with a lot of motor vehicle accidents, other accidents, drownings, homicides, suicides, sexual assaults, and uh, severe trauma. So certainly drinking in excess has a myriad of problems, some of them very short-term, such as the accidents and injuries, and some of them very long-term, like liver disease. Is damage reversible if someone is able to stop completely? There are certainly conditions that respond to a reduction in drinking or abstention. Some of the brain problems associated with heavy alcohol use can show some improvement over time when people don't drink at all and when they return to normal nutrition. Certainly, some of the effects on muscle and on nerves can improve somewhat. They don't typically go back to normal. People who have gastritis, irritation of their stomach related to drinking can experience some improvement in that condition. People who have recurrent infection or inflammation of their pancreas, pancreatitis, will certainly have fewer episodes if they stop drinking. Risks for certain diseases like cancer will likely go down when people stop drinking because the risk is cumulative related to the amount of drinking that people do and and the duration of their drinking over many years. So, yes, in general, many conditions will improve if people stop drinking above those recommended levels. What are the risks of alcohol use when someone has certain neurological conditions such as epilepsy, MS, migraine, for example? I think for many medical conditions that are treated with medications, alcohol is a potential problem because it interacts with a lot of medications that changes their metabolism and their blood levels. So that's certainly something to consider. Epilepsy is a special case because when people drink in moderate to larger amounts and then stop drinking, it increases their risk of having seizures. Migraine is a condition that in some people is triggered by alcohol, and certainly for people who have migraine, alcohol is something that they may learn to avoid. And then migraine is a condition that some people treat with medications that interact with alcohol, Probably the most important one to be aware of is acetaminophen, which is sold most commonly as Tylenol. Alcohol enhances the toxicity of Tylenol on the liver. The two drugs together can be particularly dangerous for the liver. 
And so people who are taking lots of Tylenol or acetaminophen need to be extremely cautious about how much they drink. There are neurological conditions that are not worsened specifically by alcohol, but where people's symptoms will get worse with alcohol. Multiple sclerosis is an example. People sometimes have trouble walking when they have multiple sclerosis and, of course, taking a drug like alcohol, which independently causes problems walking, will make matters much worse for those patients. Finally, how would you assess and diagnose alcohol damage in the brain? If the concern was, did alcohol damage their brain, certainly brain imaging studies, particularly magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, is helpful in looking at whether or not there's atrophy or enlargement of the fluid-filled spaces of the brain related to long-term drinking. There are a variety of nutritional disorders that affect the brain that are much more common in people who drink heavily, and some of those can also be diagnosed with the assistance of magnetic resonance imaging. There are so many different things that happen to people who drink heavily that ultimately impact the brain that in a way, looking at an imaging study or even an autopsy of the brain of an alcoholic or somebody who's drunk very heavily during their life is like looking at a battlefield after a series of major battles. There may be evidence of trauma to the brain from falls. There may be evidence of nutritional deficiency and the specific lesions associated with that. If there's been liver disease, there are some changes in the brain that one can see either at autopsy or on brain imaging. And on top of all of that, there probably is a toxic effect of alcohol on the brain that can result in, in atrophy of the brain and enlargement of its fluid-filled spaces. One never sees any of those alone or rarely does one. More often, one sees all of them acting together and probably potentiating the effect of one cause of brain injury on the other. So brain imaging is very helpful. Certainly if people who have been drinking heavily are worried about their cognitive function, their memory, there are very good neuropsychological tests that can be done to document cognitive function and particularly memory function. Thank you, Dr. Charnas, and thank you for joining us today at Neurology Now. I'm Stephanie Stevens.